Um, so I'm asking why here, but that why question becomes even more interesting when we talk about exactly what we observe. Okay. So we're going to allow for there to be two different independent variables. Not one, two. <laughs> Jeez. And by that specifically, I mean, number one, the frequency of the light. And I'm talking a little bit different terms here, but the frequency of the light, I'm going to write as, um, I, I'm, I'm going to do it the proper way and write it as new. So the frequency new, and that's how we write it. It's kind of like a, a V that's a little bit drunk and wobbly, um, but it is in fact both pronounced and, and written new. And so remember, if you have short light, short wavelength light, which is blue light, you have a high frequency. If you have long wavelength light, what that means, so basically the frequency, by the way, just to be clear, um, this entire, the, these wavelengths of light, you can imagine all traveling forwards at the speed of V. And if you were to put like just a little kind of antenna here that would gauge as light goes past how many times the light wave goes up and down, which is precisely what antennas do actually. The electrons literally get pulled up and down at exactly the frequency of this light. And that's because in one second, let's say if the frequency is 90 hertz, which is way, way down, like extremely low for light. But if the frequency is 90 hertz, what that means is 90 wave crests would pass us every second. So if 90 wave crests pack us, pass us per second, um, that's, that, that's uh, what we're talking about as far as a wave number, if you will. And the shorter the wavelength of light, the higher the frequency. So if you have more waves packed more densely, we say it's a higher wave number. So there's more waves packed more densely, you end up seeing more waves pass per second, therefore you have a higher frequency. Let's see. And we happen to know that blue light has a very short wavelength, so very high frequency. Red light has a very low frequency. And if you go further out away from the visible spectrum, the further into the infrared and then radio we go, the lower and lower the, the frequencies get. And the further into, say, the UV, X-ray, and gamma ray range, the higher the frequencies get. Um, now, in the middle ground, there's uh, the green light, which is kind of in the middle, so a middle uh, frequency f. And by the way, I've just, I've been writing this wrong the whole time. <laughs> I said I was gonna use the letter nu, so mid frequency, low frequency, and high frequency. If you wanna use f, that's fine, that's also standard. And um, based on this, we can change this continuously. So start from, you know, a very low frequency, zero, and or, or essentially zero and ramp it up um, gradually. And we see certain effects. And the second thing, by the way, is the intensity of light. And I'll call that just capital I. Now that's a little bit confusing here. Um, so what, uh, well, I mean, it's not. It's to you, literally, how light, how light the the how bright the light looks. It's more difficult to say than it would, than you would think. So, how bright is the light? If you have a, a flashlight with a continually variable intensity, um, what it's likely using is what we call a variable potentiometer, or just a resistor that can take on a continuous spectrum of values. So, what you can do is begin with a very high resistance. In other words, limit the current through that, that uh, flashlight to extremely small values, meaning that you're going to get a very low lumens output. And then as you decrease the resistance, you allow more and more current to flow through that light. So like for the old fashioned light bulbs, that light bulb would heat up and it would emit more light. And it goes typically as to like the, the 16th of the power of, of the temperature, because that's effectively what you, what you do by turning the current, you're heating it up and it glows because of the heat. That's an incandescent light. Um, for monochromatic light, it's a little different, but basically, if you think about a laser pointer where you can like make it brighter or dimmer, that's exactly what, what you're doing, changing the intensity. And so, 
we have these two variables, i and nu, and what we're going to measure is, so our dependent variable, uh, in all cases, we're going to measure the current. And this is the dependent variable. So for both of these, think of this as the x variable. Think of this as the y variable when we plot them here. And I'm going to raise the left-hand side. And let me just go ahead and drop a couple sample graphs and see if you can kind of piece the puzzle here together to, to see what would cause this to be true. It, it's not really, but whatever. Um, there are three variables, so in a sense it's three-dimensional. Um, so we can. what I'm going to do is I'm going to graph kind of in an xy grid the two independent ones, uh, frequency and intensity, and you can think of the third variable, the response, the uh, dependent variable, as kind of a height meter here. Um, I'll, I'll do it a little bit differently, though, um, so it'll hopefully make sense. So first of all, if you were to graph the frequency, uh, let me do it a little bit smaller. Okay, so what I want to do now is label the axes. So I'm going to do a little bit shorthand. I'm going to, on the first two here, I'm going to graph the frequency again in an increasing manner. And on the y-axis, I'm going to graph the current. Um, <sighs> I'm already using I here. I'll use the electrical engineer version of it, I. Now, it would be DC, so you actually should be using capital I, but we're already using that. So, again, I'll do it a little I like that. I usually like to reserve little I for square root of negative 1, but I'm a mathematic mind person. Um, so current versus frequency. And you know what? Screw it. Current. I like that better. Okay, now for these two graphs, we're going to do the same thing, except instead of the current versus frequency, it's going to be current versus the, vo um, the intensity. I. And I'm, I need to make a correction for the bottom two. <laughs> I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. And let's just go through one by one exactly what response we're going to get. So um, before we do that, why don't with a pencil, why don't you try to fill in what you might expect? And what we're going to do again, we're going to start at a very low frequency and we're going to measure the current as we increase that frequency. So in other words, we're going to measure the amount of electrons that are jumping ship across that uh, capacitor to fill the, the current. Uh, and then uh, try the other thing as you increase the intensity of the light bulb. So as you shine more and more light onto the plate, how will that affect the current that we get out? So just think about these two at first here. So this is actually what we end up uh, finding out, that, you know, maybe somewhat expectedly, and this, you know, it kind of makes sense here, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into a little more why in a moment, but if we start with a very low frequency, something that's like, you know, even longer than, you know, the wavelengths that your body emits, um, your bodies emit uh, light that you can do the calculation, but it, it stands in the pretty mid-infrared, by the way. Um, so, so if you have light that's, say, 100 meters long, a very long uh, radio wavelength, and you start shortening that, you're going to record what happens for the current as you gradually go through the infrared and then the, the visible range. And here's something that's interesting. And now, don't read anything into the color other than it's this, <laughs> what I'm using. Um, what we find is that if we're doing this at a constant intensity, and by the way, this is important. So we measure the current at constant intensity. And that's going to be true. Here we're going to keep at a constant frequency. You know, again, you can only change one variable per time. So if we measure that at a constant intensity, and the only thing we change is the frequency, what we find is that when we start actually seeing the light, when it's in, you know, the infrared and then even the red, we're not actually seeing any current at all. We don't have any current. And again, to be clear, we have, let's say, red visible light. Then we'll have green visible 
and then we'll have blue over here. That's the visible spectrum according to frequency. And so oddly enough, like you keep ramping it up further and you still get no response until all of a sudden you hit a certain value. And then now as you increase it at a linear rate, the current that you draw also increases at a perfectly linear rate. And I'm going to label this a very specific frequency, new subcritical. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to label it new sub, yeah, critical. And I've now twice broken my rule of calling the frequency new. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, so that's a strange result. That's not something that we should expect. So there is some minimum value there that after that, it's a perfectly linear amount. So let's now take that same situation, but flip it. Let's, let's take some random frequency here. So at a random, um, at constant new greater than new critical, because that's really important. You don't want to try to change some other variable when you're not getting the response here. So let's take some known response. And now what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to measure the current based on extremely low intensity, as low as I can go down below or, or, or before zero, but not actually at zero. And then, so once I go up in increasingly high intensities, I'm going to see what happens. Does the current change? So what we get here is now let's imagine our, our first data point. Let's just put a open circle at zero because this isn't really an experiment. If you don't have the flashlight on, you're not going to get current. But now what we're going to do is we're going to measure the current versus increasing intensity. And here, what we find is um, at the lowest value you can get, you have quite a high current. And as you increase the current, you're going to keep exactly, sorry, if you increase the intensity, you're going to keep exactly the same current. No, I'm sorry, guys. That's not at all right. It looks like this. I'll explain to you what I was uh, confusing that with. This is what we get. Zero intensity gives us zero current. And as we increase that intensity, it's a linear response. Now that's for new greater than new critical. For if it's for less than new critical, which I'll draw like this, for new less than new critical, or even equal to, because there's essentially no current there, you get something that looks like this, zero at all times. And turns out, as long as that, as that new is greater than the new critical, that every response looks the same and every response has the same um, uh, uh, slope uh, to, to a given extent. And we'll talk about that in a moment. 